Jesus' people know the joys of redemption. So they hold a passion to teach lost souls about salvation. We know the joys of redemption. We hold a passion to teach lost souls about salvation. We carry out the Lord's people, carry out the Lord's great commission. And it's highlighted on the screen. Would you say it with me? Equipping disciples to make new disciples. Amen. Y'all are so trained at that. We're not just saying it. Collectively, we're doing it. Individually, I hope you are too. And that these special set series of lessons are encouraging you in this. To bless the entire body. And those not yet a part of it, we are familiarizing ourselves and have been familiarizing ourselves with these three study booklets. The verses, the discussions, the arrangement of content in these three studies. It's good to have something to go off of because sometimes people say, I just don't know where to begin. Well, you can't say that anymore. Uh, We hope that you are letting what you hear make you feel more confident to share. And at some point... Everyone does need to know the truth within these booklets. And in our sermon time, we are reading the verses, we're reading the scriptures, answering the questions in a way similar to what would be done in a study to demonstrate for you how it goes and maybe in some respects how it flows. Uh, You could guide another through these same verses and in the same arrangement. You can customize it as you go, as we'll see today. But good news, you don't have to talk as much as I do. You really don't. After they read the verses, have them always answer the question, yes. You might just be able to say something as simple as, good job, that's right, let's keep going, next verse. You could do that. Uh, Sometimes you may have to say something like, let's read that verse again. Maybe explain a detail or two and then say, yes, that's the answer, good job. But you have plenty of teacher note space on your copy of the large booklet provided And I encourage you to take many good notes, especially today. What we say here could help you preemptively answer some common questions. You don't want to make it boring. You don't want to make it just like a, okay, next. Yep, that's right. Okay, next. If you're teaching what you are convicted in and giving your life to, it will show. And you just can't help but say something that accentuates the point just read and leads into the next point to be read. We are training ourselves, and it's exciting to consider that those currently lost could become our brothers and sisters, our spiritual brethren, because of what we're doing right now. We're preparing ourselves. We're getting familiar with the content, and we are still thinking about those on your bookmark, uh, your given bookmark. If you don't have one, they're still available out there. Write some names of people who you care about, and to build on each week's assignment, yes, keep praying for them. Keep letting them know that you are. Keep up the meal invites so that they can be with you and you are a spiritual person so your conversation will be spiritual. It will be attractive and appealing and insightful, encouraging to them. Uh, If you did not yet send a card, it might be odd to send them another one, but if not, consider that. Write them another note. But in addition to your efforts, this week, the key word is lesson link. Of the almost 800 video classes and sermons uploads that we have on our webpage, oak-hill.com and vimeo.com slash oakhill, of the 800 lessons, surely there's one that would be uniquely appealing and of interest and helpful to the person you're thinking of. Surely, scroll through that. Just scroll through that and see if you don't find one that does. And then you do, guess what? You find the link, the number to it. Write out that link or type it in. Sometimes you can just click share if you're using your phone and say, this lesson was helpful. Don't say, here's a lesson, you need to hear it. Please don't do that. You're trying to cultivate the soil of their heart. And if that's a little too complicated for you, these green cards have our web address right there, vimeo.com slash oakhill. Give them this card. Maybe write the date of the lesson that you think will be helpful. Have them go to the page and scroll down to that date. There are a lot of easy ways to do it. Just share a lesson with them and say, this helped me. I've been thinking about you and I wanted you to get the blessing as well. So a simple assignment and it may do more good than you know. One mission, our mission, is to get them to the cross. That's in book three, essentially. Wait, what? 
Our mission is to get them to the cross, and that's the focus of book three. Book one, the green book, is all about the authority of Christ in Scripture, right? The authority of Christ in Scripture. You've got to establish that. We've said it even in our one study approaches. You've got to stand up and be able to let them know, even if they don't believe this, this is where you're coming from. This is the fully inspired, inerrant Word of God. The standard in all religious matters and the will for our lives. What are you saying by this? This doesn't just contain God's Word. This is God's Word. And they need to see that you believe that. And develop that authority for it. When you develop the authority of and respect for the word in book one, it will help you be able, in fact, to avoid some of the things in book two, if you so desire, because you've established that. And you can quickly explain, maybe not as much as the book takes you through, but I understand why they had to print a lot. Uh, We're going to have some fun today. Book two is all about the ownership and the organization of the church, Christ's church. And if not by mere curiosity, what would help a person endure books one and two to get to the most important of book three? What would help them endure that? The first two books do address a major need among God's people and for people to understand where we're coming from. Reverence for God. Respect for the word. And then devotion to doctrine. You've got to have that. You don't have a body that's unified under Christ if you don't have reverence for God, respect for the Word, and devotion to doctrine. But there's something missing in those first two books. You may have noticed it already. Frankly, it is up to you. It's up to you to let the Lord's love carry them through up to book three because they will know through you This is somehow all about our soul's salvation because you and the Lord care about them. Let that be obvious. So it's encouraging and it's expected really. It's encouraging that it's expected for us to break script sometimes and to stress this key. Throughout the books one and two, please commonly stress in the words that you say and what you're building up to that Christ met our greatest need and gospel obedience is the key to salvation. That's what you have to stress and build all the time. God loves us. He met our greatest need and gospel obedience. Whatever that means right now, it's all about leading up to salvation. Being forgiven leads to a whole new life. This is all about what was the purpose for these studies? Salvation and ultimately glory, glorifying God. That's the why behind all of this. So meanwhile, it can be a proper time and place to present the prospect with a preview of the principles and the practices of assembled worship. It's good to let them know what we do and what to anticipate, right? Right. And to teach as you go, uh, some people maybe abuse certain opportunities. You will have to discern that on your own. I'll explain that as we go. But what are the key verses from sections 1 and 2? We're trying to do these. uh, It's best to do these all in one setting. But in a sermon, we have to split it in half for time's sake. But these were the key verses and points from sections 1 and 2 of book 1. We talked about the church being established. Matthew 16, 18, on the truth of Jesus' identity and soon proclaimed all authority, Jesus says, I will build my church and death and hell itself won't stop it. That's encouraging that the church that Christ built will outlast this world, right? Things that man build won't, but that's a, that's a related point. Ephesians 1, 22, God the Father has given His Son, God the Son, the Word, all authority, all things. He's the head over all things, including the church. So I guess that's pretty important. The man and the plan are both important. The church, in verse 23, is described as His body. The fullness of Him who fills all in all. If Jesus is important and the church fills, it represents who he is and carries out his mission, then the church is probably more important than people on earth will ever know, certainly those outside of it. If they could only see how important the church is, through God's eyes, they would jump into it ASAP. John 17, verses 20 and following, Jesus prayed, um, Jesus prayed for all who believe in him to be one. Why? Because he's the one head for the one body. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, Christ is preeminent in all things. So he is honored as the head of his spiritual body that was purchased with his own blood. The church is his body. 
Section two, we talked about, we began talking about the organization of the church. And just by teaching truth is the best way to unravel the not the doctrinal error. Uh, people get things uh, all tangled up. So when you go back to the truth, we can see how far we've strayed. And we just emphasize with all of these proof texts that the Bible's blueprint, God's blueprint designed for each congregation's autonomous structure is to have elders, qualified elders who serve in different capacities like shepherds and bishops and overseers, same different terms referring to the same people. And of course, yes, there are deacons, there are specialized and assigned servants to get certain tasks accomplished, but we all serve God and we all realize that Christ is still the one and only head of his church. Isn't that incredible? His body members render their service as the head sees fit. If you really stress the authority principle early on, it will help you later on. We conclude today with booklet, well, we conclude the booklet uh, to the blue book today with sections three and four, the functions of assembled worship. We've sung about them today. And then we'll conclude briefly with some identification marks of the church. How to tell it when you're driving through town, at least some of the early signs, and see if they got that step one or two right. First, some notes I do need to share. I uh, just do need to share some notes. Contentious matters of strong opinion or preference could easily prevent one from being saved. There are many important issues that I would rather deal with after salvation lest they, the issues that are important or sometimes not important, and we think that they are, hinder someone from the most important thing, which is their soul salvation. We'll deal with some details later. But it is important to know that a simple, basic study presented in love can promote peace and unity and love, which certainly pleases God. And I hope that in my style of presentation that that comes across and encourages you to find your way to do the same. Church, his church, follows his instruction. Here's a key phrase. His church, his instruction. His church, his structure. His church respects his blueprint for worshiping him. If you stress those points as you commonly talk verse by verse, the point will be made before you even have to say some of these things coming up. His people want to worship him. That's a good quote. His people want to worship him. His people want their worship of God to be pleasing to him. Is God pleased when he says A and people start arguing over B? Is that path really what we should travel? What motivates a person to argue with God? Well, he certainly knows our hearts, and I want to talk a little bit about that. I hope you're taking good notes. God knows our hearts. He knows when others make wise discernments. He also knows when people change the blueprint because they simply care more about pleasing themselves. So for our purposes today, I will emphasize that God even knows when worshipers follow the blueprint, but their hearts are far from him because they're just either not engaged in the moment or not living daily as they should. So these are matters to talk about. His people want their whole life to glorify him. Why did I say that? There's a reason I said that. It prevents them from saying that later. His people do want their whole life to glorify him, including how they function in assembled worship. Don't we all just want to please God? That's our primary purpose, of course. On the slide, there's some extra comments you can write down. I'll speak some of this verbatim, but like the orange statement in text, orange text. This presentation is crafted with the belief it is sometimes best to merely inform and later explain. Sometimes that is. It's good to be equipped and prepared either way. For time's sake, I made a, a couple discernments myself. Time prevents me from sharing full explanation of which hermeneutic is used for which verse. Uh, and that's why I'm going to make available to you on your way out for those fewer, I suspect, who are interested in having a six-page college note uh, document, and including a college paper I wrote, 
on the uh, hermeneutics that are used for different circumstances and in different ways and times and how to discern scripture for proper application for, for today. Uh, it, gets, it gets detailed and it's good to know, good to have this in your arsenal and understand where people are coming from and to prepare when they ask, well, why do we do it this way? Because of that verse. You will be ready. Some of this stuff influences even how I reword the questions. But Take this on your own. Enjoy studying it later. It even addresses in a college paper I wrote 10 years ago, and I still feel the same way, uh, the varying views on a few of our acts of worship. So have fun with that afterwards. I have made that available to you. I have to equip you. But however, in this presentation, I will have some anecdotal quips that will more greatly help you just by addressing the point simply in an attractive way. Because uh, there are points of contention when you deal with how people worship God. Uh, they feel strongly towards things. The more confident you are with the material in this book and the argumentations thereof will help you feel more free to adapt as necessary based on the person you're talking to. Never change truth, but sometimes you can, you can take a liberty and wait if you have to. Remember, salvation is most important right now. I humbly share that my discernment of those whose worship to God is most pleasing are those who realize it's not about them or us. It's about Him. And people who understand that, truly believe it, are off to a good start. Good worship, therefore, is, and you can see it on the screen, not for nor determined by the spectator. It's not a spectator sport. Nor is good worship determined merely by any personally preferred experience of the participant. That preaches harder to us, I believe. Worship is to praise God. And we can talk sometime about the psychological, emotional, and spiritual benefits of doing things God's way. I will try to emphasize that. But that's the key, doing things God's way. God says, do this, and it's glorious. Look at the wisdom as to why. And that, let that be the emphasis. His people reverently do things His way. And while His way seems too simple for some to believe, there is much wisdom seen in Scripture's simple design. No one should be able to say, I don't know how to worship God. Because the Bible tells you how to do it and then you realize it's so simple anyone can do it any place any time they can use that blueprint to express their heart whether collectively or alone according to spirit and in truth this is going to be fun so let's deal with the details verse by verse the study has begun it's good to see you glad you're able to meet back at this time uh, we've got some verses to read i'll help you as we go but you want to take the first verse sure john 4 24 we're going to talk about the worship of the church now god is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth must we worship god in spirit and in truth well of course that's what the text says god wants a relationship with us that's why we're made different from the animals. That's why we are, in our own spirit, made after God's image, to have a relationship with God. And feel free, feel free to quickly explain this phrase, in spirit and in truth. Let me ask you what that means. In spirit, just say with the right heart. Right heart. And the right heart seeks to worship God as he desires, right? Seeks to follow the blueprint. So they, the right heart seeks right truth. Truth. The, in spirit and in truth, which means the approved instruction. God, I have a heart that says, what do you want me to do? And I'll do it. I want to be pleasing to you. Is it not living by truth that sets us apart? John 17, 17. Let's go to that one. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. What is truth? Jesus is talking and you can explain how Jesus is God, talking to God the Father, but God is God, and they're one, they're unified. God's Word, yes, God's Word. God's instruction is truth. Whenever you read this, you can know it is truth. So, should we honor God by worshiping Him as His Word directs? Well, yes, that's logical. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. I'll take the next one because we remember Matthew 15, 9. Their worship to me is vain and unacceptable because they're teaching the commandments of men instead of God's word. Wow, what a concept. That worship could be unpleasing to God just because of man's way over God's. Yes, it is possible to have worthless worship in God's eyes. And here's a rewording for you, I'll speak. So when people place their contrary teaching above his word, 
when they place their contrary teaching above his word, does God accept their worship then? I can deduce the answer would be no. That's not pleasing to God. So let's now turn to Luke chapter 22. This is one where uh, I want to explain a little bit while you're turning. Okay, you're good. You're already there. Great. Um, Brethren, to you collectively, a piece of instruction. This is your opportunity to address many important issues while stressing that we simply follow God's blueprint. That's all you got to stress in a loving way. Not combative, please. After they turn there, say something like this. We're about to study how, uh, how some verses describe how God wants us to worship him. We're about to study how the Bible says God wants us to worship him. Some of these can be done any day, anywhere, of course. But the New Testament church has a couple special practices on the first day of the week. Have you ever wondered about the communion, what we call the Lord's Supper? Well, and here's your explanation time. Just keep Lord's Supper explain. On the night before Jesus' crucifixion, uh, he and his disciples were observing what is now an Old Testament holiday, signifying God's deliverance, and protection of the Israelites from slavery and death. Make the comparison. Jesus instituted what we now call the Lord's Supper by putting new meaning to the same emblems they were about to partake of. So let's have fun reading this. Thank you. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. I will take and I will reword this question for you because in the context, I have to say, (laughs) yes, Jesus taught his disciples how to think and partake of what would become the Lord's Supper. Frankly, at this moment, they didn't anticipate the resurrection as they should, nor would it how they would understand its impact of first-day worship for all time. They later learned, and that you can say that, they later learned, and then they did what we also do today. I just can't help but let the study of hermeneutics apply. Did God command this? Did Jesus command this? I say, uh, it's technically not a command for us, but that's another story. But you don't want to take them down that road. Don't be so confusing like I am to you right now. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing of which we bless. Is it not, and when Scripture says that, it's about to say, okay, let me tell you what it is. The communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Ah, You see there in the New Testament, as years have passed, they remembered what Jesus said. They were taking of it properly. When you and I, when when Christians gather and they drink the juice, they eat the bread, they think about his sacrifice and deliverance from sin that we might live. But even more than that, this, and this is the key, this is an act of worship in which we fellowship with God. Why are we doing all this? The Bible says just do this. Why? We're fellowshipping with God as we're praising Him. Make sure you stress that, the why, the motivation behind it. Taking the cup of the vine's fruit is a key way that our hearts express worship of and intimacy with God, the Christ who died for us and shed His blood that we might enjoy a true life. The body, or I should say the bread, is it represents the physical body. And it's a way that our spirits commune with the Christ who sacrificed his physical body that we might live and have spiritual true life through his truth. So this is an act of such great significance that they did every week. They did not let a week go by to observe it. How did I word that? Let me reword that. You know, this event is so important that they didn't miss it. Some of you know exactly why I worded it that way. This event was so important that they never missed it. Every first day. Every week has a first day, and they met every first day for this reason. And we can see that borne out in Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, this is referencing the Lord's Supper uh, in this case, in the previous covenant, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, 
Ethnic Israel was instructed to remember the Sabbath. If you want to make that comparison, feel free. Um, Ethnic Israel was commanded to remember the Sabbath. So yes, they observed every Sabbath because every week had one. But in Christ's covenant for spiritual Israel... Anytime ethnic Israel is, com- is, is mentioned and there's a comparison to a command, speak of spiritual Israel. This is now the pattern for us today. The communion. Every first day of the week, yes or no, yes. This is what they did. And so we see by approved apostolic example, if we want to be like they were and do what they did, then we'll do the same thing. So by implication, should Christians today participate in this act of worship every first day of the week? If we want to do what they did, yes. If we believe this is the blueprint, yes. Absolutely. And this is why we do what we do. It's so important. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. This is what they did when they gathered, folks. The, the disciples continued steadfastly in, and then the blanks just repeat the clauses of the verse. Apostles' doctrine, what they taught. We have what they taught. It's written for us. They were inspired as well. Jesus told us to listen to the Spirit who would inspire them, so we listened to them in that case. Fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. We will be, or will we be pleasing if we do what they did and continue steadfastly in that? Absolutely. We want to be pleasing to God, so let's just write up our own way to worship. Uh, I want to do what I know is pleasing to God, so I will listen to his inspired word. That's this principle of authority. That's why we do what we do. We reverence God. And then just go on to the next. There's another significant act of worship on the first day of the week, and it's associated with that, and it involves a type of fellowship with one another. It was something that you could do any time, individually, but collectively there is a special benefit that comes with knowing that you are partaking of one another's needs for meeting your brethren's need. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Contribution. Contributing to the brethren's needs. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, so it's the same principle here, so you must also do. On the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, um, that there be no collections when I come. The focus was not on the money. Paul certainly didn't want someone to ever say that he was doing it for the money. That was obvious he wasn't. He wanted the focus when he got there for sure to be about what he was there for, to preach the gospel and to help the brethren. And the same thing is true for us. We, um, it's true for us. Is it God's will that we give as we've been prospered? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Uh, harm comes when we hoard. Since the Lord's Supper is observed on the first day of the week, and it's mentioned that weekly contribution is conveniently prudently practiced on this first day is it then something we should do uh, on the first day yes now some of you are forming questions and i i I hear your mind some of you are with me feel free to ask me questions afterwards i'm ready Uh, it's in that sheet we'll have some fun talking but it's something good to do when we assemble Another act of assembled worship is Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. Tell me that truth. I want to hear it and remind me. In spiritual songs, love that melody. Singing and making melody here in your heart to the Lord. Now, does this verse teach that we should sing? Yes, indeed it does. Wow, you're telling, okay, so you're telling me, take good notes, <laughs> that the almighty creator who cannot be surprised by anything, who knows all and has created the wonders of the universe, is both praised and even pleased by my singing, my off-note singing. Really? Yes, he is. Because God is loving, God is wise, and when we sing, expressing our heart, he hears that. This is a command. It's amazing. God is loving and wise. He gave me a command of praising God that I can do anywhere, anytime. And then when we're together and, and worshiping in the manner of the early church, this is incredible. He hears our heart the way our ears hear harmony. And it's beautiful in the assembly. The next time, you you can use this phrase, 
you use this phrase in a sentence, in the manner of, we worship in the manner of, and say that's actually the original definition of a cappella. It, it's, it's a worship in the manner of the original church. Why? Just say they worshiped God and edified each other by vocal singing. Absolutely they did. And isn't it great to share that experience? I'm so encouraged when the truth I know is, is elevated in song and I participate it with my brethren praising God. That's just great. We're talking about the assembled worship. We're talking about acts of worship. Question, did you see how I focused on the glory of the command? Use the authority principle. Use the silence only by application so that we, what we avoid versus what we do. I hope you took notes on that. If not, take notes on the recording later. I focused on the command with a desire to please God on the standard of Scripture. I employed three hermeneutic principles just then without having to teach on them. From this point forward, the book takes a person through uh, what I would consider a straight line, i.e. rigid hermeneutic study. Uh, I caution you in this way. If the focus is on what God says to do, is this the right time for a 20-minute study on hermeneutics explaining why we don't do what we don't do? You will have to decide that in the moment based on who you're talking to. It can be done confidently if you're ready for it. Um, it can be done wisely. And again, I reference the, verses, uh, the, the extra sheets that will equip you in this. But I recall something that Rob said on a Monday morning session. He said as well that Many important issues, even side issues. He does not want mere opinion or strong conviction over some important matters even to detour a person's path to the cross. And I agree. So if you feel that the principle and the point has been made, uh, don't shoot yourself in the foot like the church has for so many decades and go to the path that so many feel like this is an opportunity to teach on. It's hard to make an opportunity for hermeneutic study. I understand that. But I encourage you to do what I'm going to do. At this point, just, um, just draw a line right under that verse and pick up at the section 4 on page 8. Beyond what has been said, I'll teach on hermeneutics any day to a growing Christian for sure. But remember, salvation is too important to clutter one's path to the cross, especially when book one was all about the authority, principle, and reverencing God doing what he says his way. So if you want one more easy transition line right after the verse is read, Ephesians 5, 19, maybe this is a, a, a phrase that will work better for you. I've said a lot for sure, but here's one key phrase. Yes, this verse emphasizes that we use our voices to praise God. And it's beautiful when that's done. But more importantly, remember our verse about pleasing worship to God? Don't talk yourself out of the worship. But more importantly than that, here's what you can stress, and they'll appreciate hearing this for reasons later explained. It also stresses that even when the blueprint is followed for it to be acceptable worship, it must also be from the devoted expression of the human heart. If you're just lip syncing, singing without that instrument of the heart plucked in praise to God, it's not pleasing to God. A heart pleasing to God is one that, and here's your constress, loves Him and reveres Him to live by His word and praise God as he has prescribed. So that's the safe approach that one can take, for sure. And we encourage that from the start. Praise God that we can praise God anywhere at any time just by singing. So that's what the church did when they gathered. Section 4, what is the church called? Um, <laughs> well, who's talking here when he says, I will build my church? I will build the church. Who built the church? Jesus built it. Whose church did he build? His now, shouldn't we respect, here's a good, here's a good quick question for you to uh, write down and share. It's a rhetorical question. Shouldn't we respect the Lord enough to let him title his own church? Yes. For Acts chapter 20, verse 28b, have them read the second half of that verse. It helps a lot minimize confusion. I'll simply say that it reminds us of both who it belongs to and why. It belongs to him. This divine church is he who purchased it with his own blood. He invested a lot in his church. So who purchased the church? 
Christ died for it. So Jesus did. I like that phrase, the Christ who died for it. That's a powerful phrase to remind people that he's the one we should be focusing on. Whose name should it be on the deeds? Same thing. Christ, the Christ who died for it. Now, Scripture, this is a bonus for you. You can take a screenshot or um, write some notes later if you want. But Scripture uses many terms to describe his one church and the members of it. These are terms describing the members' relationship to both Jesus and to one another. We are called in Scripture disciples because we're students of Jesus. We are called saints because we're called to live a holy life according to his truth. We're called brethren because we share a common identity as family. We're called children because we bear the image of the Father and we are his endeared children as a result. In Acts chapter 11 verse 26, believers are simply called Christians because they follow Christ. No hyphenated terms because the Bible is pre-denominational. Are there terms referring to the whole church? Yes, good question. I want you to notice what these scriptural terms are for his church and how they all have something in common. In Matthew 16, Jesus is talking, so it's Jesus' church, the church of Jesus. The word of is possession. He possesseth. He has it. It's his, the church of Christ. Uh, in Acts 20, the church of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, the church of God. The body of Christ, Ephesians 4. The bride of Christ, Romans 7. And then in Acts 8, 1. It's simply spoken of as the church. Why? Because these are not the terms of his divisions. And stress that before they tell you. Is this the names of his denomination? No. These are not the terms of, his, of the many divisions of today. Because in Christ there is no division. I want you to imagine how Paul would look at you and then hopefully preach at you. If you were to ever to go back in time and be able to ask him directly, Which church are you a member of? What? In his letters, he preaches hard to prevent, prevent that type of question even today because there is only one, both then and now. We stressed that last week in our lesson time. But we will highlight this next verse soon because when it comes to the church, the name it wears is significant. After all of this, you might just want to write down this phrase, His people cherish His name. His people cherish His name. That will remind you to say all of that as well as they're eager to wear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and following. It's worth reading, and I'll simply stress for time's sake, that the title, the title within something expresses honor to that something, the title. Titles express honor, and it's important for the church to give honor where it is due. Give honor where it is due. I'll be flashing a lot of answers on the screen for you, but for oration sake and ease i'll reword a lot of this <laughs> the church is not to wear the name of a mere man for that man would be the one glorified nor after some religious act or denominational body of doctrine no scripture teaches against division so it doesn't have any title of denominational influence in fact the church of Christ that he established is pre-denominational because we just follow him. I'll give you time to write those answers in the blanks, but, but that's what all of these questions and answers is to lead a person to. If you choose to take a person down this path, keep a steady, calm grip on that steering wheel. It could go in many directions, and you know it. So sometimes if you just stress the point, point's made and done with it. But it's good to help them see deductively how, oh, wow, I'm in a congregation maybe that, that uh, is giving credit to a name or some other religious act. This is not good. So once the point has been made from 1 Corinthians 1, go to now Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Keyword, authority. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So yes, we desire to do everything by the Lord's authority. Absolutely, I know that you do. Putting it into practice isn't always easy when you have a preference. But we still care about doing things by the Lord's authority. And yes, that includes the name that we wear. Now, just put down here, uh, put a caution symbol, put a flag, put the phrase uh, uh, PT, which in this term means proof text. This is a proof text used to stress the point. Uh, if you study hermeneutics like I encourage you to do, uh, you, you will know more and, and probably hesitate sharing this verse like I am uh, for this purpose anyway. But I'll clarify it. Romans 16, would you read that verse? Yes, I'll read it. Okay, great. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, brethren, um, 
we're going to apply our hermeneutic here and say this is a cultural term, which means godly greeting. Please greet me with a godly greeting by acknowledging my importance and, and special relationship with you. If you kissed me right now, I'm sure that a lot of people would take notice. Don't do that right now. But it's in God's word, but that's the application. And then it says, show God's love. Yes, the churches of Christ greet you. That is a descriptive term of who and whose we are. So yes, that title is in Scripture. And yes, it honors the Christ who built his church. So we will let the church wear his name. And that's a good descriptive term for us. Hebrews chapter 8 verses uh, 4 through 6, particularly verse 5. Just as Moses was divinely instructed on how to make the tabernacle... And take those instructions seriously. We must also give careful attention to follow the Lord's pattern in the, uh, in the better covenant, made on better promises, so that upon being saved, and the Lord adds us to his church, and his church it glorifies him. That's what we're going to talk about next week, how we become a member of his church. So in summary, part six here, point six. Until we talk next time about this, think about all these things. I know we'll give you time to think about it. Just remember this. His people follow his blueprint for worship. In living their whole lives, yes, and in assembled worship together. And his people cherish their distinguished identity. So maybe you want to be a part of that church right now. Well, next week we're going to deal with how to do that, but uh, right now I'll give you the summary version <laughs> of how to repeat the things that you already know well. The New Testament pattern produces New Testament Christians. How do we respond to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? How does the Bible say that we become a member of His church? Very simply. It's uh, in the faith response of baptism that we are buried in water, for the remission of sins, by faith in His grace, raised to walk in newness of life by the power of the very Spirit who gives us newness in life. <laughs> That's beautiful, isn't it? That is so beautiful. We're hoping to get a person there. But maybe in our studies you're already there. You need that encouragement. In all of this, we have to humble ourselves before God or we sure won't be pleasing to Him. But if we are, we want to worship Him and thank Him for the salvation that He offers. Let's make that happen as we stand and as we sing.